It's my great honour and privilege to, um, to have been one of the persons that's invited Chris up to speak to us in the school today. I've known Chris for 15 or so years. Um, I first met Chris uh, after I'd worked in Thailand um, in between my two degrees as an architect in the early 90s, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and when I returned to the University of Nottingham in the UK, Chris had joined the teaching staff at Nottingham. Uh, Chris had previously spent time at the University of Singapore and had developed a passion for Southeast Asia, specifically Malaysia and Singapore, um, which I certainly shared after my two years in Thailand. Uh, and Chris was my thesis tutor, uh, actually my written dissertation tutor. Uh, and then a few years later, um, after I left uh, the University of Nottingham, we, we met again in Malaysia, both on the invitation of Ken Yang. We were both speaking at a summer school that uh, the Ken Yang had convened in Malaysia. Chris Abel has a fantastic international reputation. He's written many books. Uh, many of his interests are aligned with mine. Um, vernacular, modern vernacular traditions in tall buildings, the love and interest in Southeast Asia, and also uh, tall buildings. Chris was one of the first people to convene a design research studio at the University of Nottingham, focused on tall buildings in the mid-90s, and that was a tradition that I continued at Nottingham uh, a decade or so later as a professor there, and more latterly here at IIT with some of the things that are going on, that were already going on here. Chris uh, has had a, an excellent connection with Norman Foster, going back a decade or more, and written several of his books. And he co-curated an important exhibition on tall buildings in London at the Royal Academy in 2003, Chris Abel and Norman Foster. Um, I'm sure he's going to tell us more about his relationship with Foster and uh, some of Foster's work specifically out in Southeast Asia. So could we please welcome Chris Abel to the Illinois Institute of Technology. One of the um, great pleasures any teacher has is in seeing one of their students doing well. And um, I'm very, very happy to see Anthony doing so well. So I'm going to his lecture on Sunday, so see, see how he does that. <coughs> Actually, it's 20 years since I've, since I've uh, been associated with the Foster practice. I, I dread to think, but it goes back to <coughs> this building here. Um, how many people here actually know about this particular building, the Hong Kong Shanghai Fair? Can, can you please raise your hands? Okay, a, a, a fairly good number because I often s take it for granted that this is one of the great buildings of the 20th century. And I, I, I tend to assume that everybody's going to be as familiar with this as they are with one of Le Corbusier's great works. But, but uh, I have to keep reminding myself that uh, it was designed a quarter of a century ago. And, and uh, most of the publicity about it uh, was, was that long ago too. So, so I'm going to go back over that uh, building uh, to a certain extent because not only is it uh, Norman Foster's uh, still greatest work, but also there's a, there's a personal connection for me. Uh, I have been uh, writing uh, since I was a student, and one of the things I'd like to encourage you as students uh, to remember is that don't, if somebody tells you you're not ready to publish yet, or not ready to go and work for a great architect, don't take any notice, uh, because uh, you're, you're never ready for anything, really. So you might as well jump in and plunge in. And I've been writing and publishing since I was a student. But uh, the commission to, to write about this building came from the Architectural Review, and it was the only the second commission of its kind that I had had. Previously to that, i have been mostly writing academic pieces, uh, theoretical works of one kind or the other. And uh, the previous work was on a building in Saudi Arabia, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs by Henny Glasser. Uh, I happen to be working in Saudi Arabia. As you'll discover, I've worked in many parts of the world. It's one reason why Foster keeps on coming back to me to write about his works, because there aren't that many people, I'm, I'm glad to say, who have lived in these places where he keeps on building. Uh, so um, I, had, I had written this long piece about the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, for the editors uh, who, who were interested in that building. I was working and living in Riyadh at the time. 
So the editors were very impressed with that. I put it into its cultural context, which uh, not so many people would be able to do at that time. And uh, I had also previously worked and lived in Malaysia for uh, 18 months, from 1981 to 82. And um, I had, was about to take up another job uh, at the University of Singapore. So when I heard that um, uh, the architecture review were going to uh, do a special issue on the Hong Kong Bank, I suggested to them that I was the best possible qualified person to do the job. <laughs> because otherwise, uh, all they were going to do was get one of their hot shot uh, critics like Martin Pauli, who had no knowledge or feel for the area at all. And they would go out and no doubt write a good piece about it. But it would all be from a, a Western perspective. So uh, persuaded of that and pre pleased with the previous piece I did, um, they, they sent me out there to cover this building. I spent one week interviewing people and talking about it. And what I discovered to my amazement, although I had certain preconceptions, I thought I was going to put Foster in his place as a Western high-tech architect who was maybe out of his depth, you know, working in, working in this part of the world and so on. And uh, much to my amazement when I, when I got there, what I saw was a Japanese megastructure. And uh, uh, considering that this, this architect uh, was born and raised in, in, in Manchester and had never built anything else of that kind, or, uh, this was the first project at all that he built out that way, uh, I was absolutely gobsmacked. And uh, so to my mind, a Japanese megastructure, while it's Hong Kong, that's not Japan. Uh, so there's something a little bit odd going on here. But uh, while I was in Malaysia in 1981, I had the privilege of listening to uh, Johan Galton, who's what we call a macro historian, paint an amazing picture about the shift in global culture uh, from the Atlantic centered countries over to the Pacific centered countries. And at that time, it was all driven by Japan plus the, the, four, the four tigers, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and, uh, um, so, and South Korea. And uh, so uh, I was primed, if you like, to uh, see in this building, to see this building as a symbol of that movement. And uh, the, the clients, the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, who have been out in Hong Kong for a very long time, had previously built on the same site another bank building, which they regarded as the best uh, bank in the world. And they wanted to do the same. Ten years down the line, uh, Hong Kong was going to be returned, the lease was running out, returned to China. It had been only borrowed, as it were, from mainland China, as a colony, at least from mainland China, and was about to be returned in 10 years' time. And they wanted to make a statement. They wanted to make a statement of their faith in the future of Hong Kong. And uh, some of the people I, I, I talked to would say, for instance, uh, oh, they think they're going to take over. They're going to take us over. But actually, what they don't know is we're going to take them over. And uh, as it actually turned out, uh, it has pretty much uh, turned out to be that way in terms of the economic systems, at least. Now, again, you must remember, <coughs> this, is, this is 19, it's, it was designed in 1981. 1981 was the time that Deng Xiaoping uh, took over, and the economic liberalization hadn't even started in China. So uh, there, was, there, was, there was no interaction with mainland China as far as the construction of the building was concerned at all. Why Japanese? Well, uh, yes and no. Uh, it's this yin-yang thing, the play between this muscular structural expressionism and the transparency of the thing. I was, I was very pleased to, 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 to hear um, Donna Robertson, uh, who's also seen the building, um, express the same amazement uh, as I uh, experienced when I first saw this building. Uh, she was gobstock, I was gobstock. Uh, it is an astounding building. But it has these Japanese qualities and the details too in the monastic care uh, uh, to attention, uh, uh, care and attention to detail, which is subsequently also described by Japanese critics. Um, by the way, in my own piece, that was the first time anybody made any connection uh, between this kind of architecture and Japanese architecture. Previously, 
there were uh, comparisons of the sources of Gothic spaces, the Gothic uh, cathedral of commerce. And as, so far as the quality of the space is concerned, that is also true. If we think about Japanese space, it's much more complex and subtle. Um, it's, it's all about uh, uh, views round the corner. You know where you've been. Uh, you know what you've seen, but you don't know quite where you're going. Everything's kind of, you know, partially concealed. Uh, some people describe it as movement space. We we're, we're, we're talk about the way that uh, Foster has gradually taken on some of these aspects. So what we're seeing is, is uh, certainly as far as the structure is concerned, this, this enormous contrast between the transparency and the muscular structure. Yes, Japanese qualities, but other Western qualities uh, there as well. Um, the, 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 the really gobsucking experience comes from uh, actually walking underneath this building. And uh, this big patch of light that you see here uh, is actually um, coming in from outside. It's being bounced down from this mirror by a giant mirror which is moving, following, tracking the path of the sun on the outside of the building. So this patch of light here actually shouldn't be there. Uh, because it's not a real atrium, it doesn't go right up to the roof, there's no direct light. Uh, so when you walk underneath, and you, you also walk through a pool of sunlight, you're walking in a pool of sunlight underneath the building, which just sh should not be there. And that's what you actually see now. There are all kinds of other references. Uh, um, the thing about the foster practice, uh, uh, I've written and talked a great deal about uh, the way that they are pioneers and uh, in initiating a different kind of process of architecture. The whole idea of collaborative working involve, involving the engineers and the mechanical engineers as uh, uh, integral members of the team. All this was pioneered by architects like Foster and Piano uh, a long time ago. These are buzzwords now, uh, which you've got your, your adventurous practices like Rex and so on, and the shop. Uh, also getting into this game now, but we're talking uh, a long, long time ago. In fact, uh, uh, all this began uh, in, in the 1970s, and the late 60s. So uh, the craftsmanship is there, but you can, you can find other elements. Uh, nothing is ever entirely new. Nevertheless, it's very, very difficult for architects to reinvent a building type. Types are not actually invented normally by architects. They kind of they kind of reproduce themselves. They're the product of all kinds of social and technological and economic pressures. And architects, for the most part, get to tinker around the edges. This may seem a little bit harsh, but it's very very rare indeed where you see a, a, a really big jump uh, in, in in the development of the evolution of a type. Now, if we look at this building, we could uh, make some references back, for instance, to Frank Lloyd Wright's Larkin building, uh, where, for, instance, for example, he also pushed the service towers towards the outside rim and so on. And we could also talk about Louis Kahn, uh, the servant spaces and the service spaces. Uh, and so there are elements of that kind uh, coming in. But of course, uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's building was a very inter totally integrated building. Uh, there were no views outside or anything of the kind. And uh, uh, Louis Kahn never, never quite got to do something like this. So when you actually look at the whole thing, finally, to my mind, uh, the, the strongest element still remains that of the Japanese metabolists uh, and, and their designs for various kinds of megastructure projects, in the, starting in the, in the late 50s, before Archigram, and in the 60s. Uh, so all this is kind of taken on board and becomes part of their sort of uh, mental horde of ideas, if you like. And it's very, very difficult if you actually ask people to say, you know, okay, where did you borrow? Why, what, what time did you borrow? Who did you borrow this from? Because it's just part of the uh, vocabulary. That's, there's the mirror. There's the top of the atrium. So the light comes in from here, bounces across here, and then straight down through there. And notice the breakup into... Uh, blocks. This is a suspended structure. They're using bridge engineering technologies. So at each level here you have these giant trusses and then the floors in between are suspended in batches. And the whole idea here is to break it down into what Foster then called uh, uh, somewhat cosily villages. And actually when they first occupied the building, I don't know what the state is now, this did actually correspond also to an organizational breakdown. But look at this. This is a project by Kenzo Tang for a megastructure tower. And uh, although I've never
never quite nailed it down. Even if you ask some of the designers, hey, did you did you know about this building? <laughs> when you when you designed the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, they probably wouldn't tell you the truth anyway. So I have I have to make up my own mind. Uh, uh, you know how much there is uh, of that. But here the breakdown. These are structural breaks. They're not inhabited links at all. So it's a purely a structural breakdown. But you can see the resemblance here, nevertheless. Uh, there, is a, there is a model there. And certainly, this, this muscularity of the whole thing and the potential, uh, which is perhaps best expressed in this slide, uh, for um, an architecture that can go on being built. This was the idea of the metabolist movement. It was something which would which was which was borrowing ideas from nature. What metabolism means all to do with growth and change. And so here was a structure which theoretically at least could be extended upwards. And although you've got setbacks here uh, which which protect uh, the sun and the sun angle to reduce the shadows over this building here, theoretically all this could be infilled. And then you've got these amazing cranes on the top. Uh, which, which look as though uh, the whole thing is still being built, but they are just maintenance cranes, of course. And uh, here we're seeing this giant uh, suspension bridge type structures here. And there, there are the load carrying uh, uh, columns here, and then these are the tension members here. So they don't take up much space at all. And there's the mirror, the under, underside of it. And this is the space underneath, and as Donald will remember, it's, it's, uh, even though you've, you've seen the drawings, uh, it's not until you start walking underneath, uh, and then suddenly you look up, and you're looking into the belly of this building. It is just uh, mind-boggling. Uh, and it would have been even more dramatic if, in fact, they got their own way, the architects got their own way. And this floor here was supposed to be glass. And underneath is the banking vaults and uh, another few layers. So the whole idea was that the whole thing would be transparent top and bottom. But apparently the, 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 the Chinese members of the, of, of the board, uh, the chairman at the time was British, but uh, mo most of the members uh, of the business community there were, of course, uh, Hong Kong Chinese. They didn't like the idea of the employees downstairs being able to look up any, any women's skirts. So I think that was probably... <laughs> Uh, the right thing to do. I suspect also there, were, there, were, there, was, a, there was a cost a factor involved. Uh, it's important also to know that the whole idea of actually uh, suspending the middle part so that you don't you have this gap in between was that originally that was done to preserve the banking hall of the original building. So, so that this building would actually stand either side of the banking hall and then the, the floors would stand over in between. And then they decided, no, it wasn't worth keeping the, the banking hall. And so they did away with that. Uh, but they decided uh, to keep this space anyway. And uh, what Foster then proposed was, well, we'll make, it, uh, we'll make it a public passageway from one side to the other. And uh, they negotiated with the, with, the, with the Hong Kong Council that if they did that and created a public space underneath, a passageway from one street to the other, then they would be allowed to uh, a few extra floors. So there's a kind of trade in terms of the expansion of the building envelope vertically. And uh, when I first saw it, it looked a little bit bleak and granite floor and so on, not too, not too friendly. They had these glass curtains either side so you don't get this horrible undergrow, under, undertow that you often do with buildings. Uh, but this is how it's now become. And then, <laughs> you must have been there more recently because, because now this is not just a passageway, it's a meeting place. Now, there, there, there's a great, very large uh, uh, Filipino community uh, in uh, Hong Kong and uh, a great many uh, women who are working as, as uh, household helps and so on. Uh, and so this has now become a center of what they call the Filipino maids. And this photograph is actually taken by Norman Foster. Which, which says what he thinks about it. He thinks it's great. I mean, he, he, people sometimes think, well, fossils are you know, a fairly, fairly cold person, there's a cold rational architecture. All that's nonsense. And uh, he's absolutely delighted uh, that it's been actually literally appropriated uh, by, by, by this group. Uh, so that's terrific. I think they could do with maybe a few benches by the look of it. <laughs> and uh, what we see here, then uh, are these spaces here, these double height spaces which become refuse centers. 
And the original idea there was that these will be also be the communal places and the social focal points uh, for, for the building, uh, which becomes an essential agreement then, a uh, uh, essential arrangement for future development in the evolution of the high rise uh, in the Foster studio. And there were supposed to be gardens, uh, but that was killed uh, for maintenance uh, reasons and so on. But nevertheless, the, there's the germ here of the whole idea of breaking up a tall tower into more human-sized chunks and then creating these social focal points, focal spaces uh, at different points up in the building. So what you're trying to, what you start to do, as you would, uh, those of you who are doing, doing Anthony's course, is, is, is to take some of those things we, we normally assume happen at ground level up into the air. So, uh, an absolute amazing building, and uh, uh, the start of, of my relationship with foster practice because they like what I wrote about it, and then since then I've been helping them produce their, their books uh, off and on, the first series and then the next series. And uh, so it goes on, so long as they keep on building in parts of the world where I live one time or the other, they uh, probably keep on doing that. Um, Japanese, uh, yes, this is, this is the, so it's on one indication, one objective indication of, of the Japanese and the former building because the Japanese client for this building, Century Tower in Tokyo, which was built a few years later, uh, visited the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank many times, fell in love with it and decided, oh, I want something like that. And so he commissioned the Fox to practice to build this one. But this is in Japan, so I'm not going to go on talking about it. Um, uh, yeah, I just mentioned that the, these uh, so-called Japanese gates here, um, they look, they, they remind many people, uh, including Japanese critics, of Japanese gateways into temples and so on. But of course, you know, uh, the engineers and the architects didn't sit down and say, we're going to make it look like a Japanese gateway. Uh, uh, the whole idea of this kind of structure is you, you push the load out to the peripheral uh, supporting structure and, and it, it helps to stiffen the whole thing. So uh, this is an earthquake zone and that's the right kind of thing to do, but it's rather nice nevertheless that it, uh, it suggests these kinds of connotations. Okay, um, then uh, somewhat later uh, we get uh, Foster's uh, next uh, major commission in uh, Hong Kong, which is an airport. Now, airports again, uh, architects didn't invite, invent the idea of airports. You, if, you, if you like, you could say that the, the most important invention was the aeroplane itself, uh, to, uh, with which architects had nothing to do whatsoever. And therefore, you know, it, things started to sort of be cobbled together to service this new kind of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, building type. And uh, it's, it's very rare again, and I'm constantly reminded going through terrible airports like O'Hara of, of just how, how, how bad these things normally are. <coughs> so we, 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 we go back a little bit to uh, the Stansted Airport, which was being designed the first of uh, Foster's airports, where he, he did reinvent the type, he and his designers. Of course, it's never Norman. Uh, Norman runs the show, he participates in projects. And, uh, but he's got an amazing team of designers, so it is very much a collaborative effort. And uh, in this building, which has been designed more or less at the same time as the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, what we've got here is a complete reversal of what normally happens. Um, uh, in airports like O'Hara, what we get is a servicing sandwich uh, at the top, where um, if it's, uh, you, know what, you know what it's like, it's an oppressive, uh, ceiling uh, looking pretty much like this one or the one upstairs where all the services are in the ceiling and uh, um, uh, so you, and you've got limited visibility outside which is absolutely crazy and it's all artificially lit which means you heat up the place and then you have to have extra cooling to cool it down and so on and uh, what they decided was that this is, none of this makes any sense so they, they, they reversed everything and they created this podium, we put all the services in the podium, and then funneled, funneled up the cooling, for example, in these pods here, these binnacles, which are also integrated into this umbrella structure here. So putting all the services down here meant that the roof then became completely free of anything, and it just had to let free to do its job, which is to keep the weather out, have skylights in, and so on. 
and, uh, and can be raised up as, as far as you like. And the really cunning thing about this is that the air is fed out here, cool air is fed out here, and if it's coming down from the ceiling, then the cool air has to heat up, has to cool down the whole of the volume uh, in, in, in that space. If it's actually spilling out here, it just has to cool the volume in which people actually move. So it's very, very rational. It reduces the amount of, of energy involved uh, considerably. The other thing is, of course, uh, it's natural light pouring in down through the roof because there's nothing to obstruct it. So there is that system here, but it's more than just that. It's more than just the rationale about reducing energy. The whole idea was, was really partly inspired by the great railway stations also of Victoria and England. Uh, Norman wants it to, wants it to reintroduce the whole glamour and romance of travel, as he called it, the sense of occasion, uh, which, is, which is what you experience when you would still go into places like New York Central and so on. Uh, uh, great public spaces uh, where, uh, for example, the, 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 the shopping malls and everything else is reduced to a scale where they, where they no, are no longer uh, of any great significance. So here is the model in terms of the master plan. Um, and in this case, what you see is the separate terminal, repeated bays here, square. You go jump into a train and you go out to, to, to the terminal where you actually catch the planes. Now, you, this is still a popular way to do things because if you have enough land space and so on, uh, then, then you want to spread it out. And of course, you can just repeat these things out in the night again. And so you just, you just increase the length of the, of the train here. When it came to uh, Hong Kong, uh, they had to recreate, they had to create a whole island. There was a very small island there and they, which had a hill on top. So they brought in all these uh, 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 extraordinary earth movers and so on. And uh, they had half of the world's, the entire world's fleet of dredgers involved at one point in time uh, to create this island. So. Uh, the whole thing is compressed basically into one building. But in this case, uh, Foster's, uh, they, they more or less worked with British Air Force Authority uh, from the beginning on the previous uh, uh, building. But in this case, they had to work with the constraints of a master plan drawn up by some other consultants. Again, it's one of those things which we, we never quite realize goes on. They take on board certain models which are given to them and then have to work with that. And uh, it was an untidy, awkward kind of thing uh, where most, most of the uh, uh, important functions, uh, the check-ins, passport controls, uh, baggage collection on the way out, uh, are, and all, all of the retail is, is collected down one end. And the rest is basically you walk down and, uh, or, to, or catch a train down to, to, to catch your plane. Uh, but very, very awkward configuration, and somehow or other, um, it was just a mass of different kinds of roofs. Uh, Foster had to do something about, about unifying this. And uh, they came up with this brilliant idea of the vaults. And again, O'Hara, you know, coming out, stepping off the airplane and going the other way, it's, it's a nightmare. You don't know where you're going, no sense of direction. Uh, even the signage is, is, is dreadful, whether or not you're leaving or coming out. I've done that twice now. Uh, well, here, the vaults, tell you where you're going. You just follow the whole thing through. And uh, so uh, despite uh, starting off with this rather awkward configuration, uh, they then unified it with this amazing roof. And we get then something like this, which is still more or less following the master plan. There are the checking counters. What's the space here in section? You're coming in. You're coming in on the train or the bus here. That's the ground transportation center where everything's integrated. And then you're moving across here, across this space. And you'll see in the development of, of, of Foster's uh, innovations of building types, you'll see some of these elements repeated from building to building and refined in certain kinds of ways. So you see an evolution of a certain kind of building and type within the practice as well. And there's the section. We'll see this space again occur, let me get this right, there are the bridges, this is the Grand Transportation Center. You move across this space here underneath this curved screen, which we'll see in a second, and you move across this space here. There's, there, there's where you come back in, this is the meeting, is a greetings hall, this is a, a double height space here. And you can see this drops down 
which drops down and then rises up at the other end. So when you walk into this area, you can more or less you know, encompass the whole area. But once you get beyond this point, although you know which direction you're going in, you can't actually see the whole thing. Now, this is totally different to the Stansted experience. Stansted is like a great big Baroque space. You can stand in only one point, and the view is exactly the same. That's what Baroque ar architecture is all about. It's being able to command the space from any one point of view. So, but in Japanese architecture, no. Uh, there's movement space. You know what the next step is, but you don't know quite what you're going to encounter. There's the bridges across from Grand Transportation Center. The train comes in at the upper level. And there you see this double height space here. And you see the, the roof start to drop through on the other side. And you get this experience here. You cross over here, and there's the people coming out, moving in the other direction. If you're departing, you go on this upper level here. If you're arriving, you come in on the, on the lower level here, and you get this amazing flow of movement. But the whole idea is that you are able, when at least you come into this big space, you know where you are, and you, you know what you, where you've got to go. But unlike Stansted, you can see that roof dropping down, but you can't actually see the end, and you certainly can't see the far end, which is, which is you know, where, you, where you take off uh, for the international. There we go. I think it's 74 meters from the floor uh, to the apex of the roof. So these, this natural light coming through. And here it is dipping down all the way through here. Now you see these tie beams here, just to prove that FOSS is not quite always as rational as you think it is, not just looking at these from an engineering point of view. Uh, these tie beams here have been dispensed with further down because they felt as the roof was dropping, uh, then they would be coming down too low over people's heads. So they dropped these things and increased the numbers of columns and fattened them up to take the lateral forces coming through on each side. This is the baggage handling area. It looks more like a temple, uh, but um, is uh, an extraordinary, it's supposed to be as large as New York, uh, the Yankee Stadium. It's an amazing space. So. Uh, this is the Supreme Court, and it's not a very well publicized uh, building. And uh, it's one where there's uh, an attempt here to relate it to the previous Supreme Court with the Dermont. So they've got this central uh, um, feature here, which is actually the last Court of Appeal, uh, which is sitting rather uncomfortably on top of the rest of the building. It's one of those buildings which I don't think quite comes off. And um, uh, my piece on this building is going to be published in the next volume. So uh, the reservations I have about the building have also been expressed in the, in, in the essay I've written about it. But nevertheless, a very interesting exercise. Uh, there you see the uh, original court of, uh, uh, Supreme Court. There's the new one, the disc on the top. Here's the Padang, the green area in the center of Singapore. There's the cricket club, and there's the river down here. So, it's a very fairly densely built up area here. And the whole idea is to break up this block into sort of smaller blocks so you break down the scale of the building. And what they're trying to do here basically is this is Singapore. Uh, you know, there are no, there are no juries in, in Singapore, the courts in Singapore. And so it's a highly sort of centralized, it's a, it's a, um, you know, a, a sort of crypto uh, democracy. But uh, it's a really uh, a fairly autocratic kind of place. And so what fosters like to do normally in a situation with any kind of building is open things out, open things up to the public, you know, cut through, slice through, make connections with the surrounding context in the street. And here they are dealing with a Supreme Court, Supreme Court of Authority, if you like. So a pretty authoritarian kind of institution. And the whole game then is to try to, to, to you know, work this kind of thing so that they do open it up, but nevertheless you know, still express the hierarchy of power that's involved here. So what they did basically was to, uh, this is a very deep plan building, if you like, so what they would normally do was create a great big atrium in the middle, but instead what they did was slice it all the way through from front to back and then across here and across here as well. And on the ground floor, the whole idea was everything official would start on the next floor up, but the whole of the ground floor would be open to the public. So you'd just be able to walk through, have a cup of coffee or whatever, 
and you'll be able, you, you, you could make it, make it basically use it as part of the as part of the city. After 9/11, they had to close off some of those entrances, but basically that's what the whole story is about. And there's the center of authority here. It's the, the last chance saloon, if you like. Uh, there are the three high courts there, and um, if if you don't get past this one, <laughs> that's it. So yes, the logic is you express this as pinnacle power, the last court of appeal, and this is put on the top of the building and is differentiated from the rest of it in this uh, amazing uh, flying saucer kind of thing here. But the trip up here is a very tosser kind of experience, up these escalators and then through here. And as you, you come in at this level, that's the public level, there, there's an auditorium down here, all this is open to the public, <coughs> and uh, the checkpoints start up here, Mm. Above here are the courts. <coughs> that's what it looks like through, through the middle. So that's the whole idea: opening it up, slicing it across through here, and opening up with these with these other openings in the floors. So it's it's all making the whole thing breathe as much as you possibly can. Uh, which uh, you might say that's what uh, uh, Singapore needs to do a little bit more of. And that's what you see when, you, when, you, when you're going up, you turn around, you can see straight out of the building. But of course, that also means that people on the outside can, can look in as well. So it's kind of exposing. It's the sort of same kind of thing uh, 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 in a less dramatic way, but a more meaningful way in some senses, uh, as we saw with, with the Hong Kong Bank, where you walk underneath and, and you look up inside this bank. It's, it's exposing itself, if you like, uh, to the public. I think there's something rather, rather very, very human about that. And uh, to give it a bit of gravitas, they use a, a laminated uh, a window uh, of, of marble, thin slice of marble, stuck to glass. And then there's another glass on the outside with an air gap in between. And that's David Nelson uh, down, down the passageway there, uh, one of the partners who's involved in this building. But a very un unfoster like kind of uh, use of finishes here. He's kind of loosening up in all kinds of ways, but uh, uh, some of it doesn't quite come off. In this case, what we're seeing is the, the five-foot way, which Anthony will be very familiar with, which Rattles uh, legislated for in the, in the creation of, of Singapore when he laid out the town plan, uh, because you need a covered arcade to protect you from the sun and the shade. So they've repeated something of the kind underneath this building here, only not, not entirely successful because you've got all these marble panels here and it's a kind of you know, blank wall, so it's a little bit dead down the bottom there. And you can see though the amazing colors of this marble at night time. And uh, there we are. Uh, the eagle has landed. <laughs> There we are again. Now this one was done a little bit earlier, and uh, of course some people say, well, it, you know, well, there's a dish there, uh, and they're just repeating the same thing, but for entirely different purposes. And I want you to grasp this one very, very quickly, because um, we're going to finish up with the Beijing Airport. Uh, it looks like a giant beetle. It, it, uh, in some ways, it's a, it's a retro design. It's a throwback to the uh, 1950s Festival of Britain uh, structures in some way. Uh, it's a roof on legs, really, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a metro station. Uh, it's the first uh, gateway, a uh, rail gateway, in Singapore after you've, le after you've left the airport. And um, uh, as Nelson explained to me, I could, well, I could, I could read it for myself, and somebody, anybody who's been out there knows what the rationale behind this kind of building is just by looking at it, and that's the test of a good building. But really, uh, it goes back to this kind of thing. And uh, sorry about the slide here. I took this image, uh, but I don't have my slide collection uh, with me, so we just scanned that from, from one of my books. Um, this is a rural village house um, uh, and a kampong house. There's no real urban tradition previous to the British uh, colony in Malaysia and, uh, or in the Malay Peninsula uh, prior to, to the coming of the British. So, so uh, it's very, very hard then to look at something like this and to somehow translate the lessons of a building like this and its uh, response to the climate into a completely different building type. But if you look at it, what we're also looking at here is a roof on legs. 
uh, it's completely open. I live in a, a, in a slightly modified version of something like this for 18 months in Malaysia, and I can tell you it really works. The whole idea of raising it up is you get the air movement underneath as well, and actually for most people living in these villages, that's the, that's the living room, very, very comfortable. And then all these uh, full height shutters here allow the air to move through uh, uh, and to completely unobstructed, and then these nice overhangs here to shed, uh, shed the rainfall. Uh, you see bits of tin being added on here. This is the original finish, which is made from, from, the, uh, part of the, from, the, from the leaves of the palm trees. But that's basically it. And this is a translation of the colonial house. Uh, and uh, you can see the translation. But it's, it's a translation from a house to a house. That's possible. It's easy to see what's going on here. But then how do you get, get from there to a much bigger building? Uh, like, an, like an, uh, a railway station or, as we'll see, uh, a, a university. So there it is. It's um, 200 meters long. Uh, the separate shell here marks the entrance way of the lift from top to bottom here. It's got a hole in the top. And there are uh, 40 meter cantilever at either end. It's a torus patch. The geometry and the fabrication of this thing are, are stories in themselves. You'll, you'll have to wait till uh, the essay is published in, in, in the book, but all these things I'm showing you about, I've, I've written detailed essays on, so you can catch up with that later. And there we see, basically, a roof on legs, completely open here. <coughs> Trains coming through. The roof is covered with titanium. Uh, that's stainless steel on the inside. The budget was increased 30%. Uh, because this was regarded as uh, something, you know, indicating the new direction of Singapore, new architecture, and as I said, the first, uh, the first metro station as you come out of the uh, out of the airport, and that's the view that you would see uh, as you approach. You, said, you, know, you you wouldn't be quite there, otherwise you get run over, wouldn't you? But, uh, <laughs> and uh, the finishes are, are extraordinary because uh, what you've got here is polished stainless steel so that as the train goes through you just get these reflections and you get a whole sense of movement and then you've got these triangular diamond shaped uh, uh, skylights which are partly shaded by stainless steel tubes and then stainless steel tubes here uh, covering acoustic uh, materials to keep the sound levels down and there we are it looks as though it's about to gallop away uh, and move out of the trains I think it's an extraordinary building it's one of my favorites and another roof on legs. Uh, only here in this case, this is uh, a whole university and uh, uh, 300 kilometers uh, north of Kuala Lumpur. And uh, the idea here is uh, brilliantly uh, indicated here in the sketch by Norman. Uh, you can tell whether or not Norman does these sketches before the design or, or during the design or after the design. In this case, you can see this is one was done during or before the design because it's different from the final design. <laughs> if you see some, if you see one of the sketches which looks a bit too much like the final one, it's probably one of those things done for the publication afterwards. Uh, don't repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> but there we get, there we have the basic idea. There's a box and a roof floating over the whole thing, and the roof then runs around the whole campus like this. And the geometry here comes from tucking in at the bottom of these hills. There's a hill here, 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 and here. Not so much down here, where it opens out towards the, towards the freeway. And so you've got jungle on the outside, right up against the university, and jungle on the inside. Now some of that got cut down during the process. The whole idea is to, to, to bring it back. It's a very, very simple idea. A great big roof running around all the way here. That's purely pedestrian and then you've got a service road running around the outside. And then there's, a, there's this central here, space here, where, which we call the drum, and uh, there's the main auditorium and the library here. So I'm just gonna run through those fairly quickly. And what we're seeing here is another translation uh, from a previous architecture, colonial architecture in this case. Uh, how, do you, how, do the, how do you borrow from what's in the region before to an entirely new building type? Well, the British had the same kind of problems. Uh, when they brought in uh, their building types uh, to administer the colony, they needed office buildings, government buildings, and so on. And uh, they also had to, to somehow or other create something which was appropriate to the region and to the climate. 
And what you notice here, uh, that all the circulation is outside. Uh, basically, you need air conditioning, it's laboratories, classrooms, but if you can put all the circulation on the outside, then you reduce the energy load considerably. And that's actually uh, what the British were doing. They didn't have air conditioning anyway at that time. It was a turn of the century building. And uh, what you've got in there is a, it's a court of justice, uh, a lot of offices and courtrooms. It's basically a box, a small box of offices, if you like, surrounded by corridors. And then they put this ornate screen. And uh, the form of the screen is actually borrowed from uh, British colonial India, from Mughal architecture. And, uh, well, uh, the idea there was that, well, uh, Malaysia is a Muslim country, and therefore if we, if we dress it up like a Muslim building, uh, then uh, they, won't, they won't think it's just us ruling them. They'll, they'll think it's one of their own buildings. But, of course, they didn't have any uh, Mughal architecture in Malaysia, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, it seemed to work. So, here we have jungle on the outside, jungle on the inside, and uh, these uh, amazing covered passageways. There's the external circulation. And here's the great big drum at the end. Uh, just a large, slightly larger scale picture. We've got five of these freestanding um, um, ranks of seating, banks of seating, so that uh, basically there's nothing here leaning up against this wall. The whole thing is sheltered. The whole idea is to create a sheltered open space in between what are basically two separate buildings sharing the same roof. These patterns here are also borrowed from uh, indigenous textile patterns. A lot is made about the circular geometry suggesting that that is also something to do with Islamic traditions. But again, it's nothing to do with Malaysia. Islamic traditions, yes, in the Middle East, but not Malaysia. So it's probably more accurate to say that this kind of thing is more indigenous to the culture, and that's actually what they uh, repeated in some other spaces too. This is the void into the library, the book stacks. The book stacks are all self-supporting. They go up five floors, six floors, short floors. And this is the gap between the book stacks and the reading spaces, the study spaces behind. And there's that pattern again. And that's what you see when, you, when you're up there. And look at that gap around the top, all the way around the building. You can see out of the jungle, but also this huge roof here just seems to sort of be floating there. So basically, again, it's a roof on lakes. The building's underneath. works perfectly. And it's a system and an approach which you can apply to different kinds of building types. And uh, that's exactly what we're seeing here with the, with the station and also with this university. I'm going to flash through this one very quickly. We, 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 we're back in China now, in Shanghai. Uh, this is uh, an office building which uh, has some of the features uh, which were developed uh, in uh, some of uh, Foster's previous work, where you see a breakup, you see the, the cores here push to the outside to brace the building, it's also an earthquake area, and these atria here break, breaking it up, but on a relatively small scale, so the whole, whole idea is to break it into chunks here, but it's nothing of course as innovative as this building here, it's, it learns lessons from it, the, the one, uh, the Commerce Bank in, in Frankfurt, uh, where you've got these huge gardens here, uh, uh, which really do elevate a kind of in a small urban park up into the air. That's what you see from inside the building. So we here, see here a smaller scale version of that. But if you, if you ask me, if you look at this building, and you just look at the building, you didn't look at the surroundings, it's in Shanghai, near the river. It's got a very strong sense of direction. Uh, the main offices are looking towards the river. This, you can see this, this is the back of the building. It's highly directional. But otherwise, if you looked at just the building and you say, well, uh, where is this? Is this in Shanghai or is it in London or New York or something? Uh, you have to say, honestly, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. So in terms of uh, that, that adaptation 
to the location. It has to be air conditioned. The pollution levels here are really very, very high indeed. It's got a triple glazed window system and so on. It's efficient, but uh, is it Chinese? Uh, not really, although it certainly looks interesting uh, when it's illuminated like this. And these are the spaces that you see inside. So you can see here a development from the early building, but uh, nothing which you could say really uh, smacks of the locality. Finally, <laughs> uh, Beijing Airport. And uh, um, the Hong Kong Airport was one and a quarter kilometers long. This one is three kilometers long. And uh, the amazing thing about it is that uh, when you go into it, uh, after the experience of O'Hara, uh, which is such a nightmare again, you go into this huge space, and all you can see is the space, but you don't feel lost. You don't feel dehumanized. In fact, the techniques that they're using in the design of this space are, in fact, ex designed explicitly to exaggerate the scale. There's something really grand and, and no skimping on ambition here. This is a statement. This is saying China is has arrived, and that's a very, 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 very clear and bold statement. And it's still so amazing that here we are again. You know, this 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 British team working with British architects, always Arabs, of course, uh, to create this thing. Now, what we're seeing here is one continuous plan. This was conceived from the start by Foster and partners. Uh, they didn't have to work to a previous master plan. They had to work to the site. But you see here, there's more or less everything spread out much more evenly. This is international arrivals and departures, and that's domestic arrivals and departures. And everything else is sort of spread out more or less evenly. Passport control is down the end. And you've got the checking counters here. You arrive here at Brown Transportation Center, which is, that's the, great, that's the shape of the parking lot. But otherwise, everything's spread out in between, more or less evenly. You have a train running through from one part to the other. And then you've got these two gaps in the middle uh, so that the aircraft can taxi around and make some shortcuts. Otherwise, they'd have to go around the whole thing uh, from one side to the other. So it's split down the middle. And this middle terminal here uh, can, be, can be used either for arrivals and departures or something entirely separate, as it was for the Olympic Games. There's the uh, Grand Transportation Center in the center and the parking lot. And the shape of the roof, yes, it's got some similarities. When I first looked at it, I said, oh, this is just another rerun of Hong Kong. Uh, um, what am I going to say about this? But when I started looking at it more closely, no, 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 it's a very, very different animal. Very different animal. The scale of the thing is staggering. And uh, this, you see, it rises up in the middle like that, and then spreads out and drops down either way, so it literally looks as though it's just you know, disappearing over the horizon. Uh, we're, on, we're up on the elevated highway, by the way. And the Grand Transportation Center is also sunk on a lower level, so you can see over it, it doesn't intimidate you. And even here, you can begin to see what I'm trying to get at in terms of the fact that you can't, you don't, there are certain views are kind of, you know, kept in waiting. So that as you come up the ramp to the Grand Transportation Center, this is in your poster, of course, you don't see everything until you get to the top and then down on the other side. And that's what you see. And these columns are 36 meter centers. It just goes on forever either side, but nevertheless, you know where the main direction of movement is. It's straight ahead. That long neck goes straight ahead. But it's dipping down, and you don't know where it's going. So it's not standstill. You can't just stand in one place and, and command the whole thing. So there's some element of movement space coming in here with those hidden reserved views. It's looking down one end, towards one end, one side. The, the entrance, it came in on this side, across here. And we're standing on top of one of these uh, cafes here. The whole point being is you know what these things are? Airports are often described as shopping malls with runways. And uh, that meaning, of course, you know, it's dominated. That's, uh, they do this deliberately. You know, they force you to go through all these damn shops. And you can't see anything else. But here, they're, they're, uh, in Hong Kong, it was the, the largest shopping mall in any airport in the world. The whole thing is kind of you know, kept down. There's still this great roof. You know you're in, a, you're in an airport. It's a great grand public space. The shopping is kept where it should be. 
that's one of my slides, and I'm, I'm proud to say that. It's not sharp, I know, but it's got the quality of light. And this, this, this amazing quality of light all, all the time, which, which Foster and his team bring in. Coming down through the skylights in the roof, but also through those great glass walls. There's one of the skylights. And this roof is extraordinary itself. Uh, it's all based on a triangular grid. The grid on the floor is absolutely regular. But you project that upwards onto a curved surface. And what you're doing is distorting the whole thing. So the fabrication of the roof involved thousands and thousands of different parts. Slightly different dimensions, slightly different lengths. And that could only be done, of course, with the kind of computer-controlled fabricating machinery, which we see, which is very, very common now. Uh, but uh, was used for the first time uh, in the Hong Kong Bank uh, several years before Gary did it, and was used here. Uh, it was used in the Hong Kong Bank by an American firm. No Chinese firms were involved. They didn't have the technology at the time. They weren't even getting off the ground then. This time, Chinese companies, Chinese subcontractors, two big firms, in fact, had to be involved because of the scale of the project. And one of the reasons why I got involved with Foster in the first place was 17 years before the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, I wrote something uh, which had to do with the way that uh, computer control fabricating machinery was going to revolutionize the way buildings were made. And that was published as an article uh, in Architectural Design. And I'm, uh, I'm reminding you about that because uh, uh, not only was it my connection, one of the connections with Foster for me, but also that was published one year after I graduated. Again, if somebody says you're not ready, don't take any notice. That was based on research I did as a student. But it took 17 years from the time when that article was published to see it come out in a major building for the very first time in the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. Now here we are again, the same machinery being used by Chinese contractors, a whole new industry uh, awakening. And looks like looks like a dragon, doesn't it? It's kind of smooth and so on, but do you think that Foster and his team sat down and said, we're going to design a dragon so that you know this, this will go down really well with the Chinese? But it's, it didn't come out like that, but it's got those kind of resonances, and the use of color certainly does, and it's quite deliberate. It's a view down into the station. You see the roof dipping down, and that's what you see when you come up the other end. And I'm going to show you, in conclusion, these uh, views down, down uh, each of the wings. There's the baggage hall again. They had several schemes um, to experiment with, with Chinese colors here, which I thought were a lot of fun. Red columns and red beams. But uh, they decided in the end to, to, to play it cool and uh, uh, not to go down the route. Pity. But an amazing space. You ask, it's just a baggage hall. Why do that? You know, why do something like that? But of course, the, 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 the suitcases don't appreciate it, but the people waiting for the baggage do. This, this, this is where the suitcases live. <laughs> Underneath. That's where it all happens. There's a meeting and greeting hall, similar to the uh, Hong Kong airport. With the Grand Transportation Center. Light, 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 all the time. If people get the idea of Foster's just about structure or engineering, it's engineering the structure with a purpose. And uh, he's one of those uh, architects with Alto, who has to be compared with Alto, as, uh, as a magician with light. Just some nighttime shots because that's how I came in. This is the first, my first view. You come in on the upper level. Uh, on the previous airports, you came on the lower level. But this time, they brought you in on the upper level because coming into the airport was the thing. When I came in here, I saw, right, <laughs> this is the planetarium. You know, it's the night sky. What, what is this? It's not just an airport. It's an amazing experience. And uh, the, the, the parking lot is naturally ventilated. Uh, I'm going to, this is, this is the last slide but one, uh, finish with a party pooper because at the end of my, if you, if you check out the architectural review, it's got my essay on the airport and 
the most important part of that essay, perhaps, is the last few, last couple of paragraphs. Um, airports, yes, inspired by railway stations, wonderful public spaces, sensification, romance of travel, but unfortunately, airports also happen to be the most unsustainable form of transport uh, you can imagine. So, uh, it may well be, and I suspect, and I, uh, I, I suggest as much in my piece, that uh, I'm not sure there's going to be any more uh, grand airports uh, of this kind. We're already seeing a very, very uh, different situation with um, uneven development of, of air traffic going down in some places. And we simply can't afford to, to pursue this. But the Chinese want it, of course, they want to keep going, but uh, how long they'll be able to keep going in the direction remains to be seen. My final slide, the real party pooper. This was Kuala Lumpur at the time when I visited the uh, university, the Petronas University that I just showed you. And that smog you see there is not local smog. It's, it's made worse by some local pollution, but that is the smoke coming from the forest fires in Indonesia, hundreds of miles away. And it happens every year, it's blown up from Indonesia, and it's part of the situation which we're, we're facing today. And when I say I want to be a party pooper, it's, it's simply I don't want you to go away thinking this is you know, terrific architecture, I want you to think that, but, but, but somehow or other the problem is solved. I call that, in some senses, feel-good architecture. It makes you feel good about what architects can do, but I show you this slide just to remind you that that's only that amount of the solution. And the solution and the problem is much, much bigger and much, much worse than I believe most people realize. I'm teaching a seminar on climate change and architecture and culture in, uh, in Nebraska where I am, and uh, I can tell you we're reading all the latest stuff and the picture is not good. This is one reason why uh, I'm enjoying my stay here right now and, and, and looking forward to next week. <laughs> and we'll see if we have the start of something new. Anyway, uh, sorry to spoil the fun at the end, but uh, um, that is, uh, Foster and his people are very, very much aware of this situation. So yes, design a good airport. As, as good an airport as you possibly can. But don't for one moment think that you've solved the problem.